This is Jack Cummings with Doorway of Hope Ministries in Hamlin, West Virginia. I want to thank you for joining me for a study in Scripture with Pastor Jack. Uh, this is Lesson 32, The Sixth Seal. Let's all celebrate and have a good time, Part 1. And again, I want to thank you for joining me. If this is your first time, welcome. If you're a regular or a subscriber, I appreciate your time. So let's get right into it. And uh, this is not a 15-minute lesson. I realized fairly early <clears throat> that uh, this was going to be a little longer. I don't know how long it's going to be, but that's why I changed the name to A Study in Scripture. So if you're ever on my channel looking around and you see A Study in Scripture, you'll know, oh, this is, this is a little longer than 15 minutes. So in Amos 3, 7, we read that surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Now, the Lord reveals secrets a lot of different ways. He reveals them in dreams, visions, uh, gifts of the Spirit, of course, through his word and through the inward witness. And Jesus said that his sheep hear his voice, so he speaks to us. The Holy Spirit also guides us into all truth. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for truth. And God also speaks to us, revealing things to us in other ways. <clears throat> and in Leviticus 23, we see God's holy calendar. Now, this is God's calendar, and God does major things according to this calendar. If you want to look at God's holidays, all you need to do is look at this calendar. These are feasts or festivals, holy days or holidays, which were ordained by God. He not only told them when to celebrate, he also told them how to celebrate. And so everything about these festivals uh, leads back to God. God told them when they would do it. God told them how they would do it. God told them why they would do it. The whole nine yards. So there are seven festivals or feasts, and these feasts are known as the Feast of the Lord. And there they are right there. Uh, and all of these are mentioned in Leviticus 23. If you ever want to do a study on it, you can go to Leviticus 23 uh, and just look. Passover is mentioned in 23.5. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is mentioned in 23.6. The Feast of First Fruits is mentioned in 23.9. Uh, the Feast of Weeks is covered in 23.15. The, the Feast of Trumpets is in 23.23. The Day of Atonement is uh, covered in 23.26. And the Feast of Booths is covered in 23.23. So uh, there you see the seven feasts, all mentioned in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. And they're expounded upon elsewhere, but you can find them all listed there in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. Uh, so these feasts were given to the children of Israel after they had been delivered from Egypt and were in the wilderness. That's when God gave them to them, was when they was in the wilderness. Now these feasts, they did two things. They put them in remembrance of what God had already done for them, how the feast had been fulfilled, or they were remembering something that God had done, but they were also prophetic and pointed to a future fulfillment by the Messiah, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we have in order of celebration throughout the year, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruit, and that's exactly how they come. That Passover begins it and then it takes about nine months to go all the way through it. You got the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, feast of weeks, which we call Pentecost, feast of trumpets, which is known as Rosh Hashanah, uh, the day of atonement or Yom Kippur, and the feast of booths or feast of tabernacles, some people call it. These Feasts can be broken up into two parts, spring feasts and fall feasts. The spring feasts are the first four, which have already been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And the last three are the fall feasts, which have yet to be fulfilled. And as I was uh, preparing this lesson, uh, here, here we go, I've already said this, but uh, it was at this point when I got started here that I realized we needed to, uh, to break what I got to say into two parts. And I had no idea that the sixth seal would cover so much information. We're still in the sixth seal, but it looks like it does. And those of you who are sticking with me, I greatly appreciate it. Um, I've been doing a lot of study for 28 years. Whew, never thought I'd live to the place where I'd say I've been doing a lot of study for 28 years, but I have, and uh, maybe I've just learned a few things. So uh, let us go over these feasts. When the, when the children of Israel were captive in Egypt and God sent Moses his servant to lead them to the promised land, God sent ten plagues to get Pharaoh to agree to let the people go. The last two of those plagues were darkness and the death of the firstborn son. Now, I think it's interesting that the Lord said that this darkness was a darkness that could be felt. It actually says that. And that ties in very closely, at least for me, with Isaiah 62, 
where it says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Gross darkness, that term gross darkness means a dread. It is a darkness that can be felt like a depression. And the glory is the weighty presence of God. So when he says, the, the, Lord, the glory of the Lord shall arise upon thee, then his glory shall be seen upon thee. It's talking about the weighty presence of God. Anyway, God told them to take a lamb of the first year and sacrifice it so that they could put the blood on the on the doorposts of their houses and on the on the lintel over top of their houses, over top of their doors, so that when God passed by to slay the firstborn, and again, I think it's interesting that it says that God said that he would pass by. I think in uh, the, uh, the movie, The Ten Commandments, they said that the death angel passed by, or we've heard that the death angel passed by. It was not the death angel. It was the Lord. In Exodus 11, 4, it said, And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the meal, and all the firstborn of feast. And then in Exodus 12:29. It says, and it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. But anyone who had the blood of the lamb on the door of his house, now that says anyone, and there were some people who, uh, you know, they knew the, knew the Israelites, and the Israelites told them what to do, and there were some people who were actually Egyptians or whatever, that did what God had told uh, the uh, Israelites to do, and they too were spared. So, so anyone who had the blood of the lamb on the door of his house, the firstborn was spared. This is the first feast, the feast of Passover. And then God told him in Exodus, he says, uh, in Exodus 12, 14, he says, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial, so you do it to remember something, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord, Throughout your generations, you shall keep it a feast by ordinance forever. So there we see the the first feast, the Passover. Uh, the Passover, the first Passover, rep, was you know all about the lamb and the blood of the lamb. And then we see that Jesus, in the fulfillment, we know that Jesus was crucified on Passover. In the fulfillment, uh, we see Jesus as the Lamb of God. And there's so many things that you can look at concerning this. Uh, and I'll, I will refrain, but uh, you may, may remember that John the Baptist proclaimed that Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Before the Lamb was slain, in, you know, when they actually slayed the Lamb, uh, they would pin it up for four days so everyone could inspect it to make sure that it was without spot or blemish. Jesus went into uh, Jerusalem on Sunday, and he sat at the temple for four days, just like they put the lamb out where everybody could look at it and make sure that it was without spot or blemish. Jesus sat at the temple for four days while they questioned him, and finally, uh, nobody questioned him anymore. They were unable to catch him in his words. He was without spot or blemish. You could do a great study on how Jesus fulfilled everything that was done to that lamb. So so awesome what God, how God illustrated everything and, and fulfilled everything. And uh, this feast took place on the 14th day of the month, 14th day of Nisan. Uh, that's the, that's the Jewish month there. Uh, we are spared from eternal separation from God when we th apply the blood of Jesus to our lives. He is our sacrificial lamb. The next feast was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and this was actually a part of the Feast of Passover, but it's called out separate in Scripture as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So after the death of the firstborn, you might remember, so we're talking about Egypt, there are Israel getting delivered from Egypt. After the death of the firstborn, they were told to get out, and they left in haste. Now, I don't know how many of you are bakers, how many of you uh, like to bake. I know most of us like to eat. Uh, if you are a baker, you probably know that when you make, uh, make uh, dough for rolls or whatever, uh, you have to let it rise. So if you're in a hurry, you don't have time to let the dough rise. So they ate unleavened bread on their journey. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a memorial of that. It remembers that. And um, so uh, to commemorate that, the Feast of Unleavened Bread began on the 15th day of the month, 
the day right after Passover. Why was it the day right after Passover? Because that's exactly how it happened. Right after the Passover and the death, and God went through and killed the firstborn son, um, or the firstborn, then uh, the next day they left. Pharaoh told them to get out. And so uh, they traveled and they ate unleavened bread. So uh, the Passover was on one day. They started their journey on the next. So God had them in remembrance eat unleavened bread for seven days. Now, in, the, in Scripture, leaven represents sin. And God told them to go to their house and get rid of all leaven in their homes. And then they had a ceremony where they would go through one last time and gather up all the leaven and throw it into the fire. Now, how was that fulfilled? Jesus became sin for us. And he was carried away from the homes of the people and crucified on a hill. Jesus was crucified on Golgotha, Golgotha, away from the city of Jerusalem. And <clears throat> what does the blood of Jesus do? The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Excuse me. So, so now we see the, the uh, second feast. Uh, was in remembrance of eating unleavened bread during the Exodus. And we know that Jesus fulfilled it when Jesus became sin for us. So, again, Passover takes place on the 14th day of Nisan at twilight. The Feast of Unleavened Bread begins on the 15th day of Nisan. Now, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the first day after the Sabbath, which was Sunday, Sabbath was on a on a. Saturday, I'm sorry, which the Sabbath, which was Saturday, um, and, and we're going to take a look at uh, how it was, uh, the Sabbath was indeed on a Saturday in our next lesson. Uh, after On the Sunday after the Sabbath, they were to take some of the first fruit of their crop and give it to the Lord as an acknowledgement of his blessing. The earliest crop was barley. So when the barley began to come up, now remember, they went into a place, they went into a land that God had given them. He told them, he said, you're going to live in houses that you didn't build. You're going to eat uh, of the fruit of the land that you did not plant. You know, I'm going to take you to a place flowing with milk and honey. And so uh, when they went in there, when, when, the, um, when the barley started to come up, it's a very early, uh, it's a very early harvest. When the barley began to come up and they would see the barley, they would go out and they would gather up some of that barley to offer it as first fruits unto the Lord. Okay? Now, this uh, this was the day, the day of first fruits. You know, Jesus fulfilled all this stuff. This was the day that Jesus rose from the dead as the first fruits from the grave. And so as they was taking this first fruit stuff and offering it up to the Lord, it was uh, pointing prophetically to the fact that Jesus was going to be the first fruit from the dead. Okay, so let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 20. It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ <clears throat> shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So uh, you might remember uh, this offering was, this, this uh, first fruits offering was to appear before God. And what did Jesus do when he rose from the dead? He appeared before God. You might remember that when Mary saw him in the garden, he said, touch me not for I am not yet ascended to my Father. So we know that Jesus ascended on high and was the first fruits from the dead. Now, um, in Hebrews 9.23, it says not only was Jesus appearing for the, before the Father as the first fruits from the dead, he was also taking, that's me, that's not, that's not how that reads in Hebrews 9.23, that's me saying it. Not only was Jesus appearing before the Father as the first fruits from the dead, he was also taking the blood to cleanse the heavenly temple. And you can read about that in Hebrews 9.23. Sorry about that. Anyway, this is the meaning of the Feast of First Fruit. So that gives us the uh, th that gives us the third of our feasts. So you got the first fruit harvest in the promised land, and then Jesus rose from the dead as the first fruits from the dead. Okay? Now, uh, these are the spring feasts, and it is so fitting for the Feast of First Fruits 
to, to happen during this time. I just flew into uh, Illinois. Just the other day, I flew into Illinois. And when we were landed, it's it, right now it's December. And when you got ready to land, you looked out. You know, it was all cloudy, really, uh, the whole way. But once we got down below the clouds and you could see everything, everything looked dead. It's December. Everything looked dead. Everything was brown and dead looking. Now, in the, in the spring, when things begin to grow again, that's when you start seeing resurrection. That's when you start seeing the first fruits from the dead. That's when you start seeing this tree that looks black, this tree that looks absolutely dead. And all of a sudden, here's these little uh, buds coming out on it, these little flowers coming on this new life. So that's awesome. <clears throat> God knows what he's doing. So first fruits is followed up with the Feast of Weeks, which we refer to as Pentecost. And you may recall that in Acts 2.1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one, in one place. Now, Pentecost, the term Pentecost actually means 50. And this feast takes place 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. This celebration marked the wheat harvest and was celebrated with bread, with leaven. The, you know, we just had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, when we come to this feast, they, they do this feast with leavened bread. Now, leaven represents sin, as I've already said. And so this no doubt symbolizes that even though we're saved and we're on our way to heaven, we still have sin in our lives that needs to be cleaned up. Uh, the church, you know, people say, well, you know, you got a bunch of hypocrites in the church. Well, that's one of the things we need to fix. Uh, you know, we still have sin. We still, Jesus said, you know, you're clean, but your feet are still dirty. You know, we're still walking in this earth. We'll still be tempted, and we'll still have failings, and we'll still have problems as long as we are on this earth. And But there's days coming, man, when uh, that's going to pass away. Praise the Lord. So um, it commemorates the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, which and was fulfilled. So so they, they did Pentecost in remembrance of receiving the law, and then it was fulfilled at Pentecost in the upper room where Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit. At the first Pentecost, which is what I'm talking about, that you had um, the uh, at Mount Sinai when God gave us the law, the law was written on tablets of stone by the finger of God. The fulfillment during the, at the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, they, uh, the fulfillment, they were written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. There was 3,000 slain for disobedience at Mount Sinai. There was 3,000 saved after the preaching of Peter there in Acts 2. There, uh, this was one of the three feasts that everyone was supposed to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. And so, you know, when, when Peter preached that sermon, the place was packed with people because they were there to celebrate Pentecost. You were supposed to go to, to Jerusalem. So um, in the first Pentecost, you had the letter of the law. At Pentecost, you had the spirit of the law. Uh, the first happened at Mount Sinai. The second happened at Mount Zion. So it's a reflection, but it's a fulfillment. So the Bible tells us that God was married to Israel. And if you want to find out more about what I'm getting ready to tell you, there's a link in the description below uh, because I'm, I'm going to make this short. But there is an excellent book uh, called The Seven Festivals of the Messiah by a guy named Edward Chumley. He's got a website called Hebrews, and he looks into the Hebrew roots of all these different things that, that being a Gentile, uh, we're unfamiliar with, you know, uh, and that book, The Seven Festivals of the Messiah, is actually available online. There's all kinds of books, actually, that are available online if you want to do some independent study. Uh, Joseph Conrad, I've, I've always been blessed by his stuff. He's got a book, Zola Levitt. Uh, he's got a book. Anyway, um, I will say this, that Ed is a futurist, so uh he, he talked, when you start reading his books, he'll talk to you about the rapture a little bit. He'll talk to you about the tribulation a little bit. But, you know, whatever. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in those books. So, in the Jewish wedding ceremony, the groom and the bride become betrothed to each other. And then there is a period of time that the groom would go and prepare a place for the bride. During this time, they were married, although the marriage had not been consummated. And if, if, if that, something happened, you wanted to break up, you actually had to get what they called it's a divorce, but what the Jews called it was a get. You got to get a get, a get, and and get means a divorce. And we see this illustrated 
uh, with Mary and Joseph when they were betrothed to one another, and then uh, what, what happens, and we see that when Jesus said, uh, in my Father's house is many mansions, if it was not so, I would have told you. Now I go to prepare a place for you, that where I go you may be also. And so he went to prepare a place just like the groom would with the bride once they're uh, betrothed to one another. He goes off to fix a, fix a place for them to live. And then he comes back. So, um, so anyway, so after they were betrothed, Mary turned up pregnant with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, the Bible tells us that Joseph was going to put her away privately. What's that mean? He was going to divorce her. They were as good as married, even though they hadn't consummated the marriage. They, when you become betrothed in the, in the Jewish society, at least back then, you were as good as married. If, you, if you, things didn't work out, you had to get a divorce. He didn't do that, of course, because uh, the Lord revealed the truth to him. And so, anyway, uh, after the place was prepared, the groom would come back for the bride and they would consummate the marriage. So, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit are both betrothal ceremonies. And those in the church are waiting for Jesus to return so that the marriage can be consummated. And uh, that brings us to our next feast. So, uh, like I said, that's the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. That's the Feast of Weeks and the giving of the Holy Spirit. The next feast is called the Feast of Trumpets. Now, we now we begin to look. Now, this is the fall feast, the Trumpets, the Atonement, and the Feast of Booths. Now, one of the things you need to remember, these first four feasts have been fulfilled. The last three feasts have not been fulfilled yet. So, all right. Uh, the Feast of Trumpets was given as a time of remembrance of the good things that the Lord had done for the children of Israel, and it marks a time of repentance and a time to awaken. As a matter of fact, it is known as the Day of the Awakening Blast, and I believe that the celebration lines up exactly with what the Lord's, what we know about the return of the Lord described in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Let's just take a look at that, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. It says, But I would not... Have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as the others which have no hope? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's their uh, spirit and soul. When Jesus comes back, he's bringing his, their spirit and soul back with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice, voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the day, what, what is this called? What was, what, what was the Feast of Trumpets called? It is called the Day of the Awakening Blast. And so there we see with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. They shall awaken. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, I think it's interesting. Why does it say that we'll meet him in the air? That's odd, isn't it? Because, because we've been taught that we're going to go up and join him in the air and go away to make our escape or something like that. To meet him sounds like a greeting, like I told, told a lady the other day. You know, if I was, uh, if me and Kathy was betrothed to one another, and uh, I said, I'm going to go fill, fix this up a place. And when I get it fixed, I'm going to come back and, uh, and be with you and get you. Uh, so I come back to her and she sees me coming. She's going to run to me and greet me and probably take me into her house and, and we'll have uh, crumpets. I don't know, whatever. So um, anyway, it sounds like a greeting, like someone's coming back to stay. So anyway. Uh, and you might remember, you say, well, no, no, no. He said he's going to go and prepare a place for Well, the Bible tells us that that place comes down out of heaven and comes to the earth. Anyway, let's go on. So here we see the people asleep. Here we see a trump from heaven and people waking up. Here we see that we will forever be with the Lord. Other imagery in the Feast of Trumpets, uh, when you get to studying it, is the coronation of the king, the king taking his throne, the wedding of the Messiah, all of that, all of that is involved in the uh, the Feast of Trumpets. Now, I would like to add that I believe absolutely because the first three, the first four feasts have been fulfilled on the day. I'd like to add that I absolutely believe that Jesus Christ will return during the Feast of Trumpets, which is known as Rosh Hashanah, 
All the other feasts were fulfilled on the day God told them to celebrate them, and the fall feasts are the same. And before you turn me off and say, oh, this guy's crazy, before you turn me off, let me show you something, because I know your belief system. I was programmed the same exact way as you was programmed. Thank you, Cyrus Schofield. So um, if we take a look at, uh, so we've uh, so we're, we've covered the Feast of Trumpets. Um, let's go on to Matthew 24. I want to show you something in Matthew 24 because the minute you say that you have an idea when the Lord's coming back, and I'm not saying, hey, it's next Tuesday at 430. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that the, these festivals was ordained by God. They were given by God. God told them exactly when to celebrate them, how to celebrate them. And we know what the things that they represent, the things that they point to. And this, But as soon as you say that, people are going to say, well, in Matthew 24, it says that no man knows the day of the hour. Well, let's just break that down a little bit. Let's just take a look at this. Um, in Matthew 24, 32, it says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Now, so this is a parable. And he's not talking about a fig tree generation. The interpretation of this parable, meaning Israel being made a nation, is a misinterpretation of this scripture. It is not talking about a fig tree generation. Everything that Jesus talked about up to this point in, in Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 70 AD. And once we get through the book of Revelation, I want to do a teaching on that. This was how God got me started on this journey. This was a section of scripture that he, the Lord used to get me to the truth. And uh, when I taught it to my church, this is exactly where we started in Matthew 24. So then it says, uh, when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye see, shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Now, what are these things? Everything that Jesus just talked about, what are these things? And if you want to open up your Bible to Matthew 24, I'm just going to go down this list real quick of the things that Jesus said and tell you how they was fulfilled. Again, in the future, I'm going to do a, a bigger study on this, a bigger teaching on this, but let's just touch on this real quick. Because of the prophecy of the 70 weeks in Daniel, so they knew when the Messiah was coming. They, they knew exactly when the Messiah was coming. Uh, the, what did the angel tell, tell Daniel? He said, 70 weeks are uh, determined for you and your people in the holy city. And then he talked about the Messiah coming, and he told him exactly when the Messiah would come. These people knew exactly when the Messiah was supposed to appear. And when they missed Jesus as their Messiah, there were many false Christs that rose up because they knew it was time for the prophecy to be fulfilled. You might remember they even asked Jesus. They said, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Why? Because they knew the time was right for him to come. And uh, so anyway, um, so uh, they missed it. They missed his coming. It talks about wars and rumors of war. There was division in the Roman Empire at that time. And the time that we're talking about now is from 30 A.D. to 70 A.D., which was 40 years. And many thought when you get to study in the Roman Empire between 30 A.D. and 70 A.D., many people thought that the Roman Empire would not survive because of all the wars and the rumors of wars, all the division that was taking place in the Roman Empire. If you do some research in the writings of Josephus, what do we find during this 40-year period? Famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. All you have to do is look at the book of Acts to see people being delivered up to be afflicted. Stephen was killed as well as many others, and everybody turned against the Christians. Family members started turning against each other because they were Christian. The gospel was spread throughout all the Roman Empire, and that's what it means in Matthew, in Matthew 24, 14, when it says the world, when it says this gospel will be preached in all the world, it actually is meaning the Roman Empire. If you've got a strong concordance, I highly suggest that you get your strong concordance out and just look and see what they meant when they said the word. You'll find out that they absolutely was talking about the word, the Roman Empire. That When they say the world, it means the Roman Empire. Or you can get on, I've told you before, if you don't have Esword, I highly recommend you getting a hold of Esword and looking at Esword. So uh, you can get an Esword and look at the Strongs and see what it, what it says. The abomination of desolation that we've heard so much about was the Roman army that had come to destroy Jerusalem. That happened. That absolutely happened. We're not waiting for the abomination of desolation. It has already happened. The Christians fled when, when the abomination of desolation appeared. And then we've talked about it before when they left 
And we had that little break there. What happened? The Christians fled to nearby mountainous cities. The entire Jewish region went through an incredible tribulation period where the Roman Empire systematically went through their cities and towns and destroyed them, eventually ending up with Jerusalem itself where the city and the temple was destroyed. It said false Christ and false prophets, they rose up proclaiming that Jerusalem would be spared before the, Jerusalem was destroyed. There was many, read Josephus, get to study in him. There was, there was many people that rose up and said that Jerusalem would be spared. Nothing's going to happen. God's not going to let anything happen. There were some people that asked the Jews to come out into the wilderness and said that if they got out into the wilderness, they would show them all these great uh, miracles and all this stuff. This stuff happened. The stuff that Jesus said was going to happen, happened. So uh, you can read the, uh, Josephus' book, The War of the Jews, and you'll see all this. The eagles gathering over the carcass, that was the Roman army. There, there's such a thing back then called a standard, and when you was in battle, you had a standard. It was a stick, and it had, had some kind of um, design on it. it, had some kind of animal on it, some kind of critter or whatever, and, and the Romans had standards. What they would do during the battle, if, if the guy standing up on the hill, the general or whatever was watching the battle, and he said, oh, man, we need our troops over there, he would take that standard, and he would yell, and he would point that standard in that direction. So the troops that was maybe, you know, 500 yards away or whatever, they would see that, and they'd say, oh, we need to go over here. That's what they did. Well, guess what the Roman standard was? The Roman standard was an eagle. And so when Jesus talked about the eagles gathering over the carcass, he was telling them that the Roman Empire was going to come and destroy that city. And when they came, they totally demolished the temple, and you know it was totally fulfilled. He said the sun and the moon would be darkened. What is that? We've already studied that. We've talked about that. When, when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed, the Jews were scattered. They had no leader at all. There was no sun. There was no moon. There was no, uh, there was no stars. There was no leader. They had no nation. The, the, uh, the, the, is, the Jews was absolutely um, scattered to the four winds, man. Now, right before the fall of Jerusalem, there was a comet to pass by. And it sat right over Jerusalem. Guess what it looked like? It looked like a cross. What did Jesus say? You'll see the sign of the Son of Man. That's what he was talking about. They saw this cross that stood over Jerusalem. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't remember how long it lasted, but it happened long enough that people talked about it. There was many, many uh, historians of that time that talked about that sign in the heavens. You can just get on, uh, get on Duck, Duck, Go and take a look. You can find it. What, what they had to say about the fall of Jerusalem. And there was a lot of crazy things that went, went that happened right before the Jerusalem was destroyed. Uh, it's been recorded by more than one story of that time that people saw chariots and horses in the sky shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem. You say, oh, I don't believe that. Man, then you don't believe the Bible. There was all kinds of stuff like that that took place in the Bible. People saw all kinds of things. People saw angelic armies. People saw all kinds of stuff. And so, you know, historians of that time said they saw this. So uh, what else was going on at that time? The gospel, while all this was going on in Jerusalem, the gospel was being preached throughout the Roman Empire. What's it tell us? That God's, what's God's messengers? God's messengers, we see in the book of Revelation, that his angels are ministers. Why would you write a letter to an angel? He says, uh, and to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? We know that those are the pastors of those churches, the ministers of those churches. And so when Jesus said um, he'd send forth his angels with a great trump to go forth and gather the elect from, the, from all over heaven, he was talking about uh, the ministers going throughout the Roman Empire and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and people being saved. Amen. So we're, we're talking about the spreading of the gospel. Then Jesus said, after, after he had talked about all those things, so now we're back to uh, verse 34. He says, when you see these things, those are the things that I was telling you about. The things that we just talked about, those are the things that he said, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. And then he says, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, he is not talking about a fig tree generation. That, that is a misinterpretation of this scripture. There is no fig tree generation. He was talking about the generation that was alive at that time. Now, this, this sounds like, when you, when you look at that, 
Sounds like a pretty definite time to me, not some uh, foggy woggy out in the middle of the sky type of thing. This what Jesus was saying in the next 40 years, this is going to be happening. This generation, now this generation, this is the same generation. I want you to think about this if, if you're not on board with me. The same generation that screamed out, let his blood be on us and on our children. What's that? You say that'd be 40 years? His blood be on us and on our children? Would, it, would 40 years cover that? I think so. This is the same generation that Jesus, when he was carrying his cross to Golgotha, there were some women who saw him carrying his cross, and they were standing there, and they were weeping. Now, this man, had his, he, had been, uh, he had been whipped. He had been beaten. He had a crown of thorns on his head. He had had his beard plucked out. He had had all these horrible things. He had been mocked. And all these different things had happened to him. And now he's carrying his cross. His, you can see the bones in his back. He was totally uh, beaten. The Bible tells us that uh, he looked like a worm. He didn't even look like a man when he was on the cross. The Bible tells us that. And so uh, all these horrible things had happened to him. And he was carrying his cross, this great burden. He was carrying his cross. And, and as he went, these women was weeping. And what did Jesus say to them? Do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. Why? Because this was the generation that Jesus said was going to go through all of this stuff. All this stuff that he talked about there in Matthew 24. This was the generation that would still be alive when these things came to pass. In Matthew 24, 34, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Then Jesus goes on to say, heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What is Jesus talking about when he says that day and hour? He just talked about all this horrible stuff and told them exactly when it was going to happen. And now he's saying uh, heaven and earth will pass away. My words won't. But of the day that the heaven and earth does pass away, nobody knows when that's going to happen. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. According to that right there, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away. But nobody knows when that's going to happen. Only God. So there's that. So in summary, uh, Rosh Hashanah is yet to be fulfilled. And just like the first four feasts, it will be fulfilled on the date that God himself said to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. That's when Jesus is coming back. Why would God give us seven festivals, fulfill the first four on the date, and then just say, I'm just going to do whatever I want on these other three? No, man. He's coming back on Rosh Hashanah. He's coming back on that day because that is the pattern that God gave us. So, um, so let's look at that. So uh, it was a day of remembrance of the goodness of God and the day of the awakening blast, and it represents the return of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Uh, the day of atonement, or Yom Kippur, you've heard that term, Yom Kippur, is a time of cleansing and then judgment. And we have always heard that the priest could only enter the Holy of Holies one day a year. You've heard that, that the, that the priest could only go into the Holy of Holies one day a year. This is the day, the day of atonement. That is the day that he went in. What, what does that day mean? It means the day of the face-to-face. -face. They didn't have to look through the veil anymore. They didn't have to look at the cloud anymore. They went in and they was with God. They was in the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. What does that mean? That means that on the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, the Lord will no longer be shrouded in mystery. I don't believe there will be any need for faith after that because we're going to see him. If, if, if Jesus, if Jesus walked, when I pass away and I, when I'm standing in heaven and Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant, welcome into the, the, the uh, land that's been prepared for you from the beginning of the earth. I won't have to have faith anymore. I'll say, hallelujah, I made it. Praise the Lord. I, you don't have to have faith when you're holding it. So anyway, uh, so that is the, the, uh, the Day of Atonement, it represents cleansing and judgment. It was the day that they went into the Holy of Holies. And I believe it represents the judgment. You know, if, it's, if it represented judgment, it represents judgment. We read in the book of Revelation that there is going to be a judgment right after the marriage supper of the Lamb. You can read it right there in, I think it's in um, 
Revelation 19 or Revelation 20, he says the church has made herself ready. The bride has made herself ready. He said, let's go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then he comes to the earth. He, he defeats the, the, uh, the beast, the Antichrist and the false prophet. And then, um, then there's a judgment. And the dead in Christ rise. And it says, blessed are those that have, have, uh, have part in the first resurrection. If you've not listened to the rapture generation, uh, please do so. I'll, I'll put a link to it. But please listen to the rapture generation. It's a sermon I preached about this very thing. So uh, then the last feast is the Feast of Booths. It is a reminder of when the Jews were living in tents in the wilderness. And they used to build it afterwards. They used to build these little huts. Probably still do. I don't know. But they used to build these little huts to celebrate this festival. Why? Because they lived in tents. When they was in the wilderness, they were living in tents. And it, and it points to the time that we will be living with the Lord forever. What we read in uh, 1 Thessalonians there, that we shall forever be with the Lord. And so there's that. They lived in tents during the Exodus. We will forever be with the Lord. Okay, so you might ask, okay, Jack, you know, you're supposed to be talking about uh, the sixth seal. That's what you told me, that you was going to be talking about the sixth seal. And here you are talking about all this other stuff, all this, all these feasts and all this stuff that took place out in the middle of a sandbox. Why are you talking about all this? Okay, well, as we've discussed before, whenever the Romans took over a nation, you know, as long as you would pay tribute to uh, Rome, as long as you would pay tribute to Caesar, as long as you would... Uh, pray for Caesar, and they would always say, who's your gods? What do you worship? What do y'all do? And he said, well, you know, we worship a frog. You know, we worship, you know, whatever. They would include that. They would say, that's cool. Oh, uh, you worship Diana? We'll worship Diana, too. That'd be neat. The more, the merrier, man. I mean, these, you know, Rome has kind of a bad uh, mor moral uh, reputation, if you're not aware of that. But anyway, so they like to do all this stuff. So uh, they just had all these different holidays. They had all these festivals. They had all these traditions. They had all this stuff. But when Christianity, which is exactly where we're at in the sixth seal, when Christianity became the religion, the, the religion of the Roman Empire, what are you going to do? And they'd outlawed all these other religions. Oh, you can't worship Diana anymore. You can't worship the sun god anymore. You can't worship Ashtar anymore. You can't worship all this stuff anymore. You can't do it anymore. So what are they going to do? What are they going to do with all these traditions? What are they going to do with all these festivals? What are they going to do? Are they going to abandon them? I did this drawing years ago, and uh, I happened to think of it when I thought about being abandoned. So what are they going to do? Are they going to, is, are they going to abandon all these holidays? Is that what they're going to do? No, they're not going to abandon those holidays, man. They're not going to, they're not going to abandon all these traditions, and all these holidays and stuff. So they decided that what they would do, instead of abandoning them, they would sanctify them. They would take their traditions. They would take their holidays, and they would sanctify them. So I, I just told you, about the traditions and the holy days or holidays. That's where we get the term holidays is from holy days that God ordained. God himself ordained these holidays. So in our next lesson, we're going to see how things were added, how things were sanctified. I'm, I'm doing air quotes in case, I know you can't see me, but I'm, I'm doing air quotes, air quotes. We're going to see how these traditions and how these holidays uh, were sanctified and made part of our traditions and our festivals when Rome converted to Christianity. So thank you for joining me. Please like and uh, share or and or subscribe. Uh, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I bless you in Jesus' name. Look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you.